Hello and welcome. I am Scarperlock and this is City of Heroes. We are with Mr. Eclipse, who is now just recently reached level 22 as our dominator. We have 44,000 to get to the next level. You won't be seeing the level up again. I'm just going to be doing one episode per level, and this particular level is level 22. So we have switched everything to all single origin enhancements except for this generously um, traded to me. Um, uh, dominating Grasp ATO, which I have in Dark Grasp, since it's the only six-slotted hold I have right now. And uh, it's a power I use a lot, so I figure you may as well have the ATOs in a power that you use a lot. So let's take a look. Let's start with the pool powers, nice and easy. We triple-slotted Health and Stamina a while ago. It was a pain in the neck to do that. We're four slots sh slot shy on the rest of our powers over here. We could have Possessed six-slotted. We could have more slots in Haunt. But instead, I chose to put things into Stamina and Health. The reason for that is we now have triple S owed stamina, so our endurance problem should be mostly over. We have triple S owed health. Um, I also put endurance reducers in teleport and in stealth so that stealth doesn't drain our end endo so much. And um, I've also put endurance reducers in dark blast, gloom, shadowy binds, and possess. And if you do the math on this, this adds up to almost nine endurance fewer per cast. If you go back and look, I often do like these three and then these two. And then repeat them. And each time I do that cycle, I'm going to be using nine fewer, eight or nine fewer endurance, which is huge. Let's take a look at the secondaries because they're easier. These are just attack powers. Um, I did a standard slotting here, which is typical for me: a single accuracy CSO, a single endurance reducer, a single recharge reducer, and then triple damage. Um, we don't have the extra slots here. Dark Blast is going to get slots next, I think, and that will also get triple damage because this thing, these two things trigger very quickly. So I feel like I want them slotted up because the stuff that you cast all the time should be six slotted, I think, as early as possible um, on a build like this. Uh, something like Engulfing Darkness, which I hardly ever use, is going to probably not get slotted until later. So Engulfing Darkness is an, a PBAOE point blank. So I only use it if I get surrounded by two or three guys, which almost never happens because I'm usually kiting or they're held. Um, so I, it's not a super useful power at this point. We may find it more useful later. Um, in Possess, I have uh, added a Confused Duration, right? So it'll actually last longer. The Confused now lasts almost over 30 seconds rather than 24. So basically I can throw it once and I won't have to throw it again for most battles. Um, and then I had added a slot to haunt. This is accuracy damage. It's, this doesn't affect me, it affects the haunts, right? So they're gonna be a little more accurate and do a little more damage. And then shadow field, um, this is our new power at level 22. It just throws out an AOE hold and it's an AOE that sits there and I think anything that enters the field will, will take the hold. Um, we can take a look here at what it does. There's a minus 15% to hit the buff for a minute on everybody that walks into the field. There's also a 5% chance of a hold. Uh, five, three magnitude hold, that sounds crappy, but there's also a three magnitude hold. So I think what happens is there's a three magnitude hold and then there's on a 25 second delay, right? It might throw another three mag hold, which could actually hold a target, I think, that has more than three mag protection, but we'll have to see how it works. And then you get the extra one from domination if you're dominating. Um, this thing that sits around for a while, uh, it uses a massive amount of endurance, so we're going to need to endurance reduce it. And I probably would have endurance reduced this rather than added the whole duration. This was a mistake. I bought this by accident. Um, I meant to click on something else and I clicked on the wrong thing and I said, well, it's an SO, you know, we'll be changing it out in five levels anyway. Let's throw it in here and see how it works. And I can always on level 23 throw in another slot and make this an endurance reducer or something if I want. Uh, probably won't do that though. I'm probably going to go for Dark Blast. We'll, we'll see. Um, oh, I did not mean to do that. Sorry. Sorry, NPC. I did not mean to do that. I was just clicking out of the screen. Okay, so we're at Special Agent... Jenny Adair. I don't have any story arcs. I haven't had any story arcs since I last left you guys. I've been working the detective to try and get new contacts because they don't have a lot of contacts here. One of the negatives of having been in Praetoria is you don't actually have the contacts in Talos Island that you would have gotten from the people in Steel Canyon and Skyway City because you didn't work Skyway City and Steel Canyon. Um, so in any case, what we're doing is we're uh, looking for uh, dealing with Anton Yeager who is Protean. And he's a shapeshifter, and we're going to um, work with her. I'm not sure what the story is. Why are we not uh, getting a mission? Here we go. Um, 
So, my only ally through the Looking Grass. So this is continuing the Praetorian arc. I'm trying to get through these. Um, I think this is the end. There might be one more. I'm kind of trying to get through these in part because these, I, I noticed when doing the last one, these are upscaled to be like the Praetoria uh, missions. And I'd rather go back to the Paragon Cities type missions. So I kind of want to get these over with, but they're not bad. So we're dealing with the fifth column and uh, we got to find out more information on Protean, who I think we will fight at the end of this arc and he will be uh, shapeshifted into ourselves. So we're going to be fighting yourself again. I think that's true. But I should be pretty good at fighting myself now, especially if I have domination going when that happens. Um, just got to hope that I can't throw haunts onto myself because that might be, that might hurt. <laughs> Okay, so we need to defeat the head of the fifth column, sell, destroy the base defenses. Um, oh, our mirror is still involved, the mirror's objectives. So, okay, the mirror, I guess the mirror is, is good now. And the mirror is going to destroy the base defenses while we fight the leader of the fifth column. So let's, uh, let's see how this works. And let's pull this guy backward and see if he, when he runs into it, if he gets held too. Nope, he does not. Oh, I guess it, it expired. Alright, well that's pretty cool. I mean, we're going to need whole durations on it. We're going to need um, some other stuff. One of the things we don't need on it is accuracy. Because um, it, like, it auto hits. It's still in here. But I guess it doesn't hold for that long. I don't know if I lead him back through it if he's going to get held again. No, nope, he does not. Now maybe that's just luck. Maybe that's the 5% chance. Now let's go back to our normal our normal routine here. So with gloom triple slotted we're doing 13 damage a tick for six seven ticks that's pretty nice so um, as we go uh, I have just posted today or yesterday yesterday um, my video about like D&D &D and name only uh, and like is is it still D&D &D if you've changed all this stuff about it and you just call it D&D &D? and um, several people have responded there's been some really interesting comments um, one person, let me actually check. I left it up here so I could give credit this time. Jerome Forbes 6830 made a really great, I mean, it's like an eight or nine paragraph comment with all kinds of great info in it. And, you know, played D&D for a long time for many years and was talking about how, you know, the differences in the game system. Now, it sounds like that particular poster is uh, happier with fifth edition than with first edition and glad that they've made the changes that they've made. And that's, that's fine. You know, everybody has their own um what's going on here what is this fiery orb i didn't put out a fiery orb what what i'm confused did i click something that's weird um you know everybody's got their own opinion and obviously you know you like what you like and you you don't like what you don't like and you know, to each their own. But I do want to address a couple things that were said in some of these comments. Just want to make sure that people are clear. So one of the comments that um, this person who made the long post that I just referenced made, talking about the uh, 100,000 copper piece, you know, things worth 1,000 gold. Instead of giving 1,000 gold or 10,000 silver, you give 100,000 copper pieces. And said... Um, if I can find the quote. Bringing up the 100,000 copper story is just a perfect example of being needlessly antagonistic. Why would a dragon ever want to do that? Where would a dragon do that? Uh, where and how would a dragon do that? All to bring it back so that if it died, it would be an annoyance to the people who killed it. Well, no, presumably that's just what the dragon had collected. And um, that's 
as an example, that was Matt Colville's example, right? I never actually experienced that. Um, that was Matt Colville's example. Uh, but I don't know what this fiery orb thing is. Like, why is it my pet now? That's really weird. Um, but, um, I, I, I don't know if anyone's ever actually had a dragon horde that had 100,000 copper, right? And I wasn't discussing or interested in um, looking at the dungeon ecology, that is, how much logic there was to whether the dragon would have that. The point of that story is that it isn't needlessly antagonistic, and I made this comment in my reply, but I just want to make it clear to other people, right, who didn't read that response, but maybe watch the video, you, the GM didn't make it 100,000 copper pieces instead of 1,000 gold to antagonize or be a jerk or be mean to the group, right? We, like, when we did stuff like this, we were playing with our friends. You're not trying to be a jerk to your friends, right? These aren't strangers. You're playing with some of your best buds. Why would you be mean to them? You're not. It was understood by everyone in the group when something like this was done that this is a challenge. It is a problem to solve. And part of the fun of D&D &D is supposed to be problem solving. And one of the things that I was decrying that is a major difference between 5th edition and 1st edition is that everything has been turned into a die roll now and they don't really seem to expect players to solve problems with their noggin, right? That's what I like to talk about, the noggin, right? Using your brain to do stuff. The whole idea of a 10,000 or 100,000 100, copper reward is if you can get it back to town, you can make something cool out of it because it's worth 1,000 gold pieces. You can buy a great set of armor for everybody in the group, or you can buy mounts for everybody in the group, or whatever it happens to be. But in order to get the money back to town, you're going to have to come up with a solution to a really important logistical problem that the GM has set for you. And there is a tremendous sense for those of us who played the game like this and enjoyed it, which it sounds like maybe this poster didn't, perhaps, or in retrospect, or like likes it better now. There's a tremendous sense of satisfaction in figuring out how to do that um, problem solving, right? How to solve that problem. You get that 100,000 copper back. The GM might even give you some other sort of a reward as, hey, that's really cool. I'm going to give you some extra XP or whatever because that was a really awesome solution to the problem I set you. We would be talking about these things in days to come, you know, in the cafeteria at lunch for, for years later about the awesome way we figured out how to get 100,000 copper back to town in one trip instead of having to use multiple trips, right? That we went into town and we used this really great persuasive argument, not making charisma rolls, but really good logical argument with one of the shop owners to let him, you know, loan us something on spec and then we paid him back in the copper pieces and then we gypped him or something like that, right? I mean, that kind of a story, again, this specific thing never happened to me in my group, but that kind of a story was, is, was, at least for most of us who played back then, that was considered part of the fun. So it was not antagonistic, just like it wasn't antagonistic for the GM to set up traps that needed you, to, that, where you needed to have that 10 by 10, that 10 foot pole, right? Or the mirror where you would look around every corridor to make sure there wasn't a basilisk or a medusa around the corner and stuff like that. Um, that wasn't considered mean if there was a random medusa around the corner, right? That wasn't considered mean. That was part of the game, and it was part of the problem solving that you were doing in order to accomplish your goals, right? To achieve the mission and, and complete the task to finish the adventure. So I do want to point out, I just want to make sure people understand this you know, I, I hope that um, that poster and other people who've talked about this didn't have a purposely adversarial GM who did this sort of thing to be a jerk. That wasn't my experience. And I don't think it was the experience of most people because if it had been, people wouldn't have played D&D. &D, right? You don't keep doing what you hate. <laughs> if you don't like it, you don't do it. Right? Guess what I do? I play Hero Side all the time. I did Praetoria once, just for fun with this character. But I don't really like Praetoria, and I don't like the villain side. 
So I only play Paragon City. I don't do what I don't like. Why would people play D&D if they hated it? I can't imagine why you would do that. Uh, maybe some of you did. I hope not. But I do what's fun. Okay? So, you know, my friends and I were not being adversarial to each other. That was not my experience in D&D. And um, maybe that's why I liked it. Maybe other people didn't like it because their friends, quote-unquote, were being adversarial on purpose to them. I don't know. But, um, but yeah, the, the, the purpose of having 100,000 copper pieces that you have to get out of the dungeon in order to get your 1,000 gold is not to be a jerk or to take the money away from you or not let you have the money, right? The purpose of it is to solve a problem, to use your brain to come up with something really cool and interesting that you can, um, that, that will be memorable, right? That will be an, a fun part of the adventure just like having traps or you know those rooms with lever puzzles and stuff that you can't use a skill roll to figure out there i mean like i used to make those in neverwinter nights adventures i once i figured out how to do them i put them in every single one of my adventures and like they got those adventures mostly got rave reviews people liked that now not everybody liked it and i did put a warning that there are this is a this has some like lever puzzles and stuff and if you don't like that uh, you might want to not want this, you know, not want this adventure. And I think in one of them, I made a way around it. Like, if you don't want to have to solve it, you can, like, do this instead. I can't remember now. Um, but, yeah, I mean, I did those problem-solving things a lot. Because that's, to me, a really fun part of Dungeons & Dragons. Right? And, again, the thing that I was lamenting was that the, tr the trend in the increasing over the... as the, edition number has gone up the trend has increasingly gone toward making a die roll to get what you want rather than figuring anything out with your brain um and i prefer figuring things out with the brain and i prefer giving my players challenge that make them figure things out with their brain now that's me um the other thing i do want to point out is that um i think it was the same person somebody talked about like what I would call dungeon ecology, right? That is to say, um, oh, the dungeons never made any sense. Well, you know, I don't know. The dungeons were supposed to make sense, and I accidentally over aggroed over there. The dungeons were supposed to make sense. And if they didn't, that was on the GM or whoever wrote the module. But that wasn't how it was supposed to be. Dungeons were supposed to make sense. They were supposed to be logical. There is a whole section in the Dungeon Master's Guide called Dungeon Ecology, where they talk about building stuff, building dungeons that um, building dungeons that make sense where the monsters in them have like a food source and stuff like that, that you shouldn't just throw in whatever monsters you want. There should be some sort of a logic to why those monsters are there. And I always did that. My friends and I always did that. So I always thought about, okay, if there's just a bunch of, say, um, giant spiders here, what are they eating? So there's going to be a spider web, and you're going to see the remnants of whatever they ate, right? And that, and that thing, whatever it is, is going to be somewhere else in the dungeon, right? So that um, you understand why there are these like dead kobold skeletons in the spider's web, right? Because if you go through the secret door and down this other passage, there are there's a kobold layer in there, and some of them got caught, right? So I did that all the time, and that was that was described in the Dungeon Master's Guide, right? Could you get it to work if you just entirely used random number generators on your tables to... the random number tables to generate your dungeon? Uh, maybe not. But if you go through and you look at, for instance, I do have a video of this if you want to watch it, the Dungeon 23, right? Now, I didn't. I only did it for like a month and a half, but this is, was in 2023. You're supposed to like create a dungeon one room at a time. And nobody said uh, that, you were, that you had to do random tables, right? But I chose to use random number generators to create the, um, the map and what was in each room. And so, um, so, okay, 
what I did was I would roll on the random number table to see what was in the room, and then I contextualized it, right? Why is this trap here? Who put it here, right? Some of it I didn't know. For, so, for example, I was trying to make, like, this sort of Lovecraftian thing, so I had, like, the wing of a Shantak bird that was pinned to the wall, and I was like, okay, I don't know why that's here, but it'll be, we'll figure that out somewhere later in the dungeon. But the whole idea of what I was doing was trying to contextualize the random number table, right? By the way, you do this in Iron Sworn as well. Even when you're randomly rolling for stuff, you contextualize it. You figure out why would it be here like this, right? And I hope you guys are watching, by the way, speaking of something totally different, what's going on here. Um, note that we are... Um, uh, we are... Um, able to hold two guys at a time now. Which makes it much easier. Oh, you know what? The pet. Is that the proc from our... Um, from our new... Uh, enhancement set? Did I totally miss that? I bet it is, so let's see. Accuracy, control, endurance... Yeah, fiery orb. Okay, that's it. That's what we're getting. I thought they were shooting a fiery thing at me, and it was turning to my side for some reason, so that's what's going on. We're getting the little pet as a proc once in a while from our hold power. That is cool. Okay, we have a problem. Burkholder got away from me. Uh, he's heading your way. So this is the alt uh, Mystery Eclipse. Mystery Eclipse Prime. So Burkholder is coming to me, or do I have to chase him down? Let's uh, let's keep going here. So every once in a while, when I throw that power, there's going to be a pet that comes out. That's actually really cool. There's Burkholder. Okay, so the reason I went ahead is domination. Bam. Got gotcha. you. Oh, whoa. Haha, <laughs> he's an elite boss. Oh boy. Okay. Well, he's fighting the pet now. Um, we lost our domination, which is unfortunate, but we got all our inspirations. Um, so, yeah. Anyway, um, everybody had different experiences, I guess, playing 1E, 2E, 3E. And um, mine were in 1E were mostly positive. I have really fun memories, particularly a basic and expert set, actually. Um, ADD was cool. A Secret of Bone Hill was awesome. But I really loved Castle Amber, and I love the Caves of Chaos. Now, the Caves of Chaos, that's a silly kind of adventure where everything is sort of living in a monster condo. But in all the adventures that we made up, there were reasons why things were where they were. And we always tried to make it make sense. So... Um, and the Dungeon Master's Guide, how they wrote their adventures notwithstanding, the Dungeon Master's Guide always said to make it make sense back in the old days. And I'm pretty sure they said to make it make sense in the Basic and Expert set as well. Um, I don't know if this guy's going to come grab me right away or what. Like, he's in ambush, so I don't know if he's going to come at me or if he's going to stay where he was. Oh, here he comes. Okay, so. Let's see if we can. Try to get him with something. Wow, he stunned me already. Jeez. Okay. I don't know if I can beat this guy. Trying to immobilize him, but very hard to do.
Okay, we've got him immobilized, I think. Not a single one of my misses worked on him, other than the immob. Ah, oh, there we go. I finally got a hold to work. Woof, that was brutal. Wow, okay, lots of rewards. Anything we need here? This is a damage we can't use. Okay. Um, I think the last thing that one of the posters, uh, commenters, it might be the same person who was talking about the 100,000 gold said was, you know, the real question is, does the game kind of feel the way it felt in the past? Um, I would say, for instance, for City of Heroes, yes, it does. Protean is a very powerful villain. Oh, man. Uh, well, we're definitely going to want to uh, get inspirations. And of course, it's right here, so I'm going to have to run off and come back, but we got to get inspirations. Um, I feel like the answer in 5th edition is absolutely not. One of the commenters made the excellent point that I didn't think about, which is that like everybody and their brother cast spells now. right? Every single class... Every, every class has spellcasting subclasses. Most of the um, most of the subclasses of most classes can cast spells. There's, it's the very rare ones that cannot. And, um, and then a lot of races have inherent spellcasting. So the only types of characters that don't that can't cast spells at all are like, Characters who, or if the character is specifically has picked both a race and a subclass of the class that doesn't cast spells, like a human assassin or something, wouldn't spell cast. But everything else can spell cast. We clearly need accuracy more than anything else. I'm going for big luck here if, because we got to be dot, we got to be missed, and we need break freeze. And let's sell these guys. Boop, 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 boop. Bash. Even fully SO that elite boss was brutal. Protean's gonna be tough, but I think he turns into me, if I'm not mistaken. And if that's true, he shouldn't have Well, he's got a lot of messes, but I should be able to break free and then you know, use my messes on him, but we'll see. Um anyway, so yeah, everybody can cast spells. Torches don't matter. Um, poison doesn't matter. Turn to stone doesn't matter. Nothing is permanent. Everything can be cured with uh, a long rest or a lesser restoration spell. Uh, somebody actually made the point. This was an actually great point. They were... Um, you know, there's this whole political football and that I don't want to get into about things like... Um, we, like Dungeon, dungeoneering wheelchairs for the handicapped and stuff like that, right? And the one guy made the point, like, why would why would there be adventurer wheelchairs when a lesser restoration would heal your paralysis, <laughs> right? Whatever your problem is, whatever reason why you can't walk, most of it could be healed with a lesser restoration. Almost any condition you could think of that is debilitating in a permanent way today can be cured with a lesser restoration and you can do that at like level five so you wouldn't need an adventuring wheelchair because you would just when you got to fifth level the cleric would just cast lesser restoration on you and you could walk right so he was like why why bother like why do we even need this as a concept now i you know there may be there may be very good reasons why a person who has a disability might want something like that rather than the magical cure but mechanically the point that i'm making isn't about the wheelchair itself but the fact that almost any condition you can think of that should that could or should be debilitating can be cured with a simple lesser restoration spell and if not lesser restoration regular restoration right and so that makes th that makes it like less 
interesting to me because there are fewer actual consequences to things. Um, so I personally think that, yes, the feel of 5th edition is very different. Very, very different. I felt more like I was playing champions than 5th edition, bad, badly a badly uh, designed version of champions. But I felt much more like I was playing superheroes. My uh, The one friend of mine and I... Um, who prefer older school D&D, refer to it as like the Marvel Cinematic Universe version of D&D, where everybody... Ooh, is this Protean up here? No. Everybody has superpowers and that kind of thing, and there's our little pet. Um, yeah, it's like D&D superheroes. That's how we kind of refer to it in the vernacular. Nobody would have said that about first edition. Even a fighter cleric magic user would not be a superhero at third or fourth level. It's just not going to happen. And so um, so in, if you're going to if your standard of measurement is going to be whether it um, is we're going to have to save domination here for protein because I don't know where he is. Uh, but if your standard of um, uh, of whether it's similar or not is does it does it have the same feel to it? My answer is for fifth edition, third edition, fourth edition DD, absolutely not. It does not have the same feel. Um, that's my that's my personal. I I would have said it felt the same when we were playing the level one and two adventures. Those felt the same because the characters don't have their subclasses yet, and all their overpowered subclass abilities and all their extra spells and stuff like that. And they can only have one or two spell slots a day, so the weight of all that magic floating around 5th edition, that's by default very high magic, um, hadn't ha that weight hadn't come to weigh us down yet, or weigh me down yet. But um, once we got to 4th, 5th level, yeah, I was like, this is, this is like D&D superheroes, right? And I, can, I, I think I may have said that, to my best friend and he said so what that's a good thing right because he think his character is based on like the one of the new mutants or one of the x-men long shot i don't know if it was new mutants or x-men but his character is basically based on a marvel superhero right and he played it in champions and then he recreated it in D, &D. so he's literally playing a superhero not only doesn't he mind that D, &D is uh, making the characters feel like superheroes, he consider, considers it a feature. I consider it a bug, right? But he considers it not only a feature, but D&D's best feature. Yay! It's much more like superheroes, right? And my answer to him would have been, dude, if you want to play superheroes, why didn't you suggest champions, right? Oh, well, I want to do it in Fantasy World. But to me, a Fantasy World shouldn't be like superheroes. This is why I like Harn and Harn Master, because that makes it feel like a Fantasy World to me. The medieval authentic stuff, the OSR. I mean, I prefer that specifically because it's not super powered. It doesn't feel like superheroes. If I want to play superheroes, I'll play champions. Or City of Heroes. But I think a lot of modern fantasy games, even MMOs and stuff, the characters really do have uh, like the equivalent of almost superpowers and lots of you know, uh, because it's a computer game and graphics are super important, they've got all these VFX, right? And so it really ends up being very much more like a superhero game set in a fantasy world, right? Rather than an actual fantasy world. And that, I think, is the feel of 5th edition. And I think the fact that everyone and their brother can spellcast is a really significant reason why it feels like that to me. And I, I don't prefer that. Now, again, if you're like my best friend who wants it to be like superheroes, then you'd be happy about it and glad that it's like that. But since I don't want it to be like that, I'm not happy about it. And I definitely think it does not have the same feel. So, um, and that's what I was trying to say, right? When I when I, I talked about some of the differences with City of Heroes, yeah, there were some differences um, from the way it originally launched. But... Um, it still feels like the same game to me when I'm playing it. And, you know, I went back and I, I mentioned this. I'm playing a scrapper now off screen. 
Esprine's Bio Armor Scrapper. It feels just like every other scrapper. It feels great. I love playing him. And I didn't have to think about how to... I don't have to think about how to slot him. I don't have to think about what powers to take or how to enter a battle or whatever. There's no thought at all. So I play him like every other scrapper I've ever played going all the way back to, you know, summer of 2004. I don't go all the way back to April with it because even though I started with the scrapper in April, I didn't really get how to play scrappers until the summer when I got into the high 20s and had SOs on everything and realized that I could be a lot more aggressive and still survive. Right? And that's when I finally learned how to play a scrapper correctly. And I've been playing and building scrappers that way for 20 years in this game, and it's still functional. And it's th these solo missions for me still play the same way. Therefore, I feel like this is still the same game. Right? On the other hand, I don't feel like there's any feeling anything like what the original D&D was like in, um, in, the, in the current version. Now, we're going to have to stop ranting because I need to really focus so we're gonna break free a couple of these and accuracy domination hold and then pets come on pets help me out I'm gonna try to throw this around him and see if it no he got out of it before I threw it down Prote oh, I hate these types of powers. I don't... This is like... This is like World of Warcraft mechanics, I think, where the um, elite boss throws down... Um, oh, and he's a plus one, too. The elite boss throws down some kind of um, area power. Fortunately, my pets are kicking some butt on him. I never did get him, catch him in that because he ran out of it. So that's a mistake. I'm going to have to like learn how to use that power a little bit more. Man, the domination's not catching him. But we're okay. So far, so good. Oh shoot, I thought the Endurance dropped. It wasn't the Endurance. And now I'm in trouble because the Domination ran out. Got nothing left. Just gotta hit him with everything I've got. Got him! Guys, I will take that. We just... Save your mirror self. No, we're going to save mirror. Can we do that? Uh, maybe not. Is this going to start damaging me? Can we help mirror? I don't know if I can. Let's try. See if we can help mirror. Yeah, a bunch of dead guys. Maybe mirrors around here somewhere. I've done this mission before, but I don't remember it. There's mirror. A bunch of mirrors. And I don't know what he's saying because the stupid dialogue's not showing, and I still haven't been able to figure out why that is. Okay, well, he's giving me some sort of dialogue, but I feel like the moon is a lot bigger on his chest. Maybe it's just the way he's sitting. Uh, which way was I going? Uh, see, I couldn't figure out where, which way I was going. Oh, well. I guess we didn't save him. Right, I don't think, I guess you can't because, like, they have to kill him because otherwise there'd be two of you in the same dimension and they don't want there to be, I guess. Just logically, there should only be one of you. 
So yeah, um, I do appreciate all the comments. Um, just because I don't happen to agree with you doesn't mean that I don't appreciate the comments. I agreed with a lot of it. I definitely agreed with the comment that said one of the main differences in 5e is that everybody's a spellcaster. Yeah, I can't remember which group it was that we were playing. One of the Savage Worlds ones, maybe? Where, like, nobody was a spellcaster except my best friend. And he's like, why aren't there more spellcasters? And I'm like, dude, sometimes not everybody wants to play a caster. Okay, what about Protean? Where can I bring him into custody? Um, Agent Adair. Reaching your chance code. Here's a letter. Here, Mr. Eclipse. So, are we old friends by the time you're reading this, or do you have no idea who I am? It doesn't matter. Um, so, this is about your Boros and your future self, I guess, writing to you or whatever. Um, okay, task complete. And we are done with this story arc, guys. It's a good way to end the episode. Uh, we're halfway to level 23, so I'll probably do a story arc or finish the detective missions or something. And then come back uh, and show you level 23 and what we've done with our new slots. Um, we can't really do anything with the enhancements that we just got because our slots are full. Our set, our enhancements are full. Um, and like all of the Praetorian Context, this one does not give you a store. I find that so aggravating. Homecoming people, if anybody ever watches this, please go in and fix that so that every single contact that you're finished with has a store that you can buy inspirations from because it's super annoying that you don't know which ones do and which ones don't in Praetoria and that all the Praetorian ones don't in Paragon City. That's super annoying. Um, okay, so we're going to stop here, guys. Until next time, I am Scrapperlock, and this has been City of Heroes.